were some of your inspirations? Well, my mother was my main inspiration. Uh-huh. Yeah, she was uh, a strong bridge, <laughs> a strong bridge to me, and for a lot of people, <laughs> really, for my siblings and for other people in our community. And she was a, a community activist too. Uh-huh. Uh, she belonged to the uh, Voters League. I think she was the last uh, member of the Voters League, which was started there by Maynard Jackson's grandfather uh, in Augusta oh, in 1948. Mr. Dobbs. Uh-huh. John uh, Wesley Dobbs. John Wesley Dobbs. Uh-huh. Uh, he went uh, through this state and throughout the South, you know, preaching the importance of the vote and the fact that you needed to register and vote you know, wherever you could. And they started voters' leagues in various cities throughout the, the South, the Confederacy, I would say, <laughs> the Confederacy. And uh, he spoke on college campuses and spoke in churches and any kind of opportunity where he had uh, a number of uh, minorities together who were not registered to vote. And they even had sessions which taught them how to vote because there was, was still a lot of illiteracy. People did not know how to write, uh, they couldn't read because keep in mind, you know, reading was a violation. <laughs> writing and reading, you could get your hand cut off or you could get killed for ri- writing, learning how to write and re- read and write during slavery. I mean, and that was perpetuated for years and years. I don't know whether you read the book, The Second Slavery, that uh, at any rate, the basic point there was that uh, uh, after we were uh, emancipated, so to speak, we really moved into a phase where we were really in a second slavery because we had no opportunity, you know, and so you had to become a sharecropper <laughs> and uh, you were always in debt to the company store, so you could never get ahead. That was um, a, a long period of time. So when you look at the hundreds of years that we really sort of came through, not the actual shackling in terms of physical shackling, but the shackling because of the economic conditions that you face, then, uh, you know, you're looking at a, a, a long period of time. And it takes some time to overcome that. And keep in mind, uh, public education was not available uh-huh, to uh, a, a blacks, uh-huh, uh-huh, you know, in, in, in churches and, uh, you know, non-profit type institutions were the uh, ones that really set up schools, you know, uh, to begin to teach us how to read and write. And uh, so there were many people in communities, uh-huh, uh, upstanding people, so to speak, who could not read and who, who could not really sign their names. And so they went through the process of teaching people how to sign their names and, uh, you know, and, and, and if you couldn't sign your name, how to mark your ex. Uh-huh. The civil rights uh, activity in a major way where it was really, I guess, uh, uh, attempting to really capture the minds of the majority community really sort of started in the mid-50s, you know, back with the Alabama, you know, bus situation and so on back there, you see. Um, we had a number of students here, sit-ins. For example, one, one, one experience I'll share with you with my uh, social club, uh, Club Couturier. Uh, during the period uh, when students were marching here, uh, you know, riches would not uh, uh, allow uh, their uh, dining room to be uh, integrated, the Magnolia Room, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, we could not, we could, you know, go and shop, uh, but we could not, we could spend our money there, but we couldn't take advantage of the opportunity. You could not eat in the Magnolia Room. And of course you had the uh, black and white fountains, uh, you know, you couldn't drink water from the white fountain. I mean, all of those things were present. But at any rate, getting back to the richest situation, um, my club uh, wrote letters to all the uh, teachers uh, during the uh, time that uh, we were really uh, on riches about opening up and uh, allowing us to uh, be treated as uh, full-fledged human beings and uh, simply said, close your account, you know, close your account. Don't spend your money where you, you know, can't be recognized as a full-fledged human being. And uh, that was a success. Atlanta didn't have quite the turmoil that was um, taking place in it. And there was a letter that was posted, the letter that we wrote was posted in the rich, you know, when they talked about the, um, and I'll try to get a copy of that, the um, uh, history of riches and so on uh, that we had written during that time, urging them to close their accounts, pay out, pay out your account and stop spending money where you're not wanted. Uh-huh. And uh, 
That uh, people understand when you hit them with the dollar, just as with the bus boycott in Alabama, you know, when people stopped riding the bus and the bus could not, uh, you know, operate fully, uh, then they began to pay attention. But, uh, you know, it was like um, Ralph Ellison says, we were the invisible man, mm -hmm. the invisible woman. You know, you weren't, we weren't paid any attention, you know. How did Richards respond? Well, Richards finally opened up, you know, with Jose and, you know, all those marching and these students from the University Center. Uh, yeah. yeah. So they didn't fight. They didn't fight your, your campaign. Well, I mean, they didn't want to open up, yeah, in the beginning, yeah. But, you know, that pressure, uh, that pressure, you know, caused them to decide that they better, you know, follow suit and, uh, you know, open up. And so we had probably, you know, less uh, violence and you know, upheaval here, you know, Walgreens and, you know, all these, you know, because that sort of started uh, really in Nashville, in North Carolina, and then it just, you know, just spread, you know, the students were standing up, uh, the students were standing up, mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any, uh, anything future-wise that you think uh, you're looking forward to? Well, uh, I just hope that uh, one day we get to a point where, um, the color of one's skin is not the major issue in terms of really how you look at a person, you know. I mean, you, I think you get to know people, you find that uh, uh, we all uh, have the same desires and same wishes, uh, same potential to, to, to do good and to do well if given the chance. And uh, I just simply say, just give us a, an equal chance. Do you believe we're close to that time? Uh, still a little bit more work to do. There's a, there's a lot more work to do. When you look at young people today, they're just not aware. They don't think, they think things are have, uh, as they are now have been that way all the time. They were not. I mean, I've lived through all of that. I lived through, uh, when I came up in Augusta, Augusta was rigidly segregated. Mm -hmm. Rigidly segregated. You went to the back of the bus. I can remember being on the bus with my grandmother and uh, and the bus driver would drive off before she could, you know, have a seat. And she sat down on there and he says, Granny, get up. Annie, get up. You can't sit there. You know, that sort of thing. And I was hoping that uh, he would not say anything else to her because my grandmother was not a nonviolent uh, person. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I said, Grandma, let's move, move back. You know, let's move back. And so, and she, and, you know, we finally got onto the back of the bus. But such ugly things. Uh, I can remember going to elementary school where the uh, bus would pass us by and just splash water all over, purposely, you know, or kids would throw rocks from the bus. I mean, those were just, you know, regular daily experiences. That, that was life uh -huh, as I lived it. Uh -huh. I'm curious if there's a story or if there is a takeaway that you would like Courtney, for example, to walk away from your experiences. What would you like her to take I would like for her to take it away from my experiences, the simple notion that Maya Angelou puts out there, uh, that you can be a phenomenal woman. You can grow up to be a phenomenal woman. What does phenomenal mean? What does phenomenal mean? That means you can just be a great woman. You can <laughs> blossom, <laughs> blossom, blossom, blossom to your full potential, that there is nothing you know, that's impossible for you to achieve if you put your mind to it and you want to do it.